So there was a time before we had patents and trademarks. There was a time when if you were an individual and you wanted to go out and invest in a new idea, if you wanted to invent something, there were few clear and compelling incentives for doing that. If you wanted to build a cathedral or a ship, you had to rely on trade guilds and labor unions. And often these were secret societies, so it would take decades before you could climb those ladders and you could impact how things were done. Now, this system existed for hundreds of years, and it created some of our most enduring technological advances, uh, our greatest landmarks, but on occasion, it would fail. Every now and then, during hardship, war, plague, famine, the need, the pressure for quick, fast solutions would drive the need for innovation. Because these networks were so closed, they couldn't mobilize very quickly they would start to bump up against the limits of their talent and their technology. And the rate limiting factor was not capital. It was not the need or the drive to innovate. It was really mind share. It was the need for fresh thinking, fresh perspective. Now, how did we solve that problem? Well, first let me say, around the mid-1500s, there was an interesting social contract. Your access to capital was largely dependent upon your social class. And our leaders started to realize that there were cracks in that system. When their experts weren't able to develop breakthroughs fast enough, they would, on occasion, break it down. They would kick the door and they would say, we're going to do things differently. We're going to offer cash rewards for the first person who can solve this problem. Now, this was what we like to think of as the early precursor to free market exchange. It didn't matter what school you went to, who you knew, uh, what you had done before, if you could solve the problem, you would win both fame and fortune. These were brave moments in our history. And when we started to look at this, when we started to research how these incentive systems work, how these prizes work, I was part of a small group of people that set up a lab in 2007 at MIT to study this, and we, we, we began looking at the early history of these models and we created a map, and we looked at the timeline, and what we noted was that the early history of prizes started in Western Europe. They began in the Netherlands, they moved down to Spain, then Portugal, uh, then back up to France, and then to the UK. And in 1627, Scotland started issuing premiums. These were bounties. These were cash rewards for soldiers who could produce, invent new weapons that could do the work of five, 10, 100 soldiers. And the most famous of those inventors was William Douglas. And what William Douglas did is he created a cannon that could be uh, reloaded three times faster, a musket that could shoot six rounds instead of one. And this revolutionized warfare. And as those weapons spread across Western Europe, so did the stories that were attached to them. So did the use of prizes. So later, in 1714, we had learned a little bit about how this works. And we had noted that they work best when they're kind of more open, more accessible. One of the great problems of that era was that it was nearly impossible to determine longitude on the high seas. This problem had existed for 209 years. Galileo and the world's leading thinkers had spent their entire careers trying to unlock this challenge. And the British government decided that they would put up 20,000 pounds for the first person to come up with a solution. John Harrison emerges, an English clockmaker, who produces a pocket watch that can accurately tell time on a naval vessel. This creates a vector so that beyond the sight of land, you could determine both magnitude and direction and identify your point on any given plane. It revolutionizes naval exploration. It expands our reach. All of a sudden, we're developing new ways of reaching new continents. And we take with that our commitment to incentivize competition, our prizes. Now, if there was ever a golden age for the use of this model, it occurred between the mid-1700s and the mid-1800s. This was the Industrial Revolution. This was in a, a time when technology was seeping into the fabric of our everyday life. Napoleon was tramping across Eastern Europe. His soldiers were starving in the fields of Poland and Russia. And he came back to Paris and he said, this can't happen. I need a way to preserve food. Uh, and out of nowhere comes Nicholas Appert, a Parisian candy maker, who delivers the solution. 
there was essential and there was trivial breakthrough. You know, there were points when France was suffering from lack of resources. They had a butter shortage, so they put out a prize for a suitable replacement, and voila, margarine on every table. What happened next was at the turn, at the beginning of the 20th century, property rights started to instantiate. Intellectual property became a fungible asset. People started to invest in ideas. There was commerce, there was industry, there was exchange, there was a way in which you could, you could take your time, you could raise money, take time, and come up with a new process, a new way of doing things. And at that time, the whole notion of prizes started to shift. They were less about inducing new products, new technologies, new breakthroughs, and they were more about demonstrating the current capabilities of known technologies. So here in the U.S., the Chicago Tribune would sponsor car rallies to prove that automobiles were safe, fast, effective, affordable, as good as a horse-drawn carriage. We had hot air balloon races around the Eiffel Tower, uh, and the most famous of these was probably Lindbergh's Crossing of the Atlantic. So for $25,000, Charles Lindbergh and nine other teams all competed to win a prize, and to collectively they spent $400,000 to do it. Because this was the modern era, this prize becomes probably the most documented case, one in which we weren't just looking at the benefits to the sponsor, we were looking at the cost on the participant. Now, Lindbergh lands in Paris, he becomes the most famous person on the planet. Um, it, the commercial aviation blows up. The industry cracks wide open. And within the year after he landed, uh, the number of commercial pilots' licenses went up threefold. The number of registered airplanes went up fourfold. The number of airline passengers went up 300-fold. And so we have this opportunity before us, which is that if you can create this telegenic, this mediagenic event, if you can prove that the technology works, we can address market failures, we can, we can open up new industry, we can expand beyond the reaches of what one prize could accomplish. Now, when we look at what happened over the next 25 years, I have a critique to make. And my critique is that for 400 years, we had been applying this model. Whenever there was a common cause, whenever there was a problem of public concern, we used prizes, we used competition, we drove innovation through competition. And around the 1950s, it stopped. And we started to take a more puritanical approach to philanthropy. We started to make bets. We started to give away grant money. We started to use patronage. We started to say, we'll find people, we'll give them the money, we'll go on, we'll track them and see how well they can do. And prizes became the domain of private industry. Then around the 1980s, around the 1990s, we started to see that it changed again. And what we have is new venture philanthropy started to take root. Now, new venture philanthropy are people who found their money recently and wanted to achieve the same results through philanthropy as they had done in their, in their, in their commercial enterprises. They wanted leverage. They wanted to pay for performance. They wanted a story that they could tell. They wanted to break open a new industry. And so what you'll see is there's this dramatic climb over the last decade. 18% a year over the last 10 years leading up to 2009 when this study by McKenzie was published. And so the question here is, what have we learned? Now, our early experimentation, we were uh, in this last decade, mostly hinged on this notion that the more money you put up, the more participation you'll get. We've since learned that that's not the case. And if you actually go out and you survey people who participate in these prize competitions, it's kind of the lowest common denominator for them. It's kind of like in the 1980s when you got the check from Ed McMahon and it said, congratulations, you've won a million dollars, and we all opened the envelope. Well, no one opens that envelope anymore. So we're seeing marketing geniuses, people who by far are known for their ability to, to dazzle and to change industry, who've put up prizes of $25 million, $30 million, with zero participation. So what do we know? When we talk to people who participate in prizes, what do they want from us? What they want from us is transparency, they want fairness, they want openness. They want two forms of value. They want to know that when they're being judged by others, they're being judged by credible authorities, people with pedigree. They want to know that they'll get feedback, vertical feedback, feedback that will come down to them so they can understand how well they did. 
And you'd be surprised to learn that whether it's a business planning competition or a competition to develop an algorithm around machine scoring, a lot of the work that we do, once they know that they have that pedigree, once they know that they have that quality feedback, the second thing that they want is they want to connect to the other people. So in the fiercest, competitive, most competitive environments, we have people sharing information through these prizes. We have people collaborating. We have people nominating others. And we are building communities around these prizes so that it's not just about competition. It's also about collaboration. So if I have one final thing to say, it's that as we look at this curve, we can tell that there's a lot of activity here. And there's a lot of failure as well. And what I would, what I would ask is that whether you're a foundation or a government agency, that you carve out just our 10%. Let's call it 10%. And let's try to use this model. We've had a tradition for 400, 500 years now. It's time that we reinvent it. And at a time when we're all tightening our, tightening our belts, when we're all talking about pay for performance and efficiency, this is the right tool and this is the right time. And thank you very much.